that lightning bolt that flew backward through the fan. I'm delighted to be here. Now you'll have to think about that. I don't explain them, I tell them. Amen? You'll have to think about it yourself. I was preaching at the, uh, the IFFB, the International Fellowship of Fundamental Baptists, over in, uh, it was meeting in uh, Indiana at the time, that particular time. You know, you don't have long to preach during those things, just, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so. And so, uh, and I like to get people used to my voice before I start preaching. And so I, I, I told them that little lightning bug thing, or it's just a little ear catcher. There were a few chuckles, uh, and I, you know, I had to go on with the message. And about 10 minutes into my message, I'm trying to be just as dead serious as I can be. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a big outburst of laughter. Now, when a preacher is preaching 90 miles an hour, <laughs> trying to be dead serious, and all of a sudden, folks go to laughing. You know, you... Uh, you automatically conclude that you've gotten your tang tongled up and you said something you weren't supposed to say. Well, that bothered me, Brother uh, Matthews. That bothered me the rest of the time I preached. So after the service, I began to inquire what were the people laughing at about 10 minutes into my message when I was trying to be serious. Come to find out what they were laughing at, the Yankees finally caught the joke. <laughs> so uh, if you catch it after a while, you go right ahead and laugh, and you will understand. Amen? I figured I'd be safe telling that here. <laughs> Can't tell that everywhere I go. <laughs> I was up in Michigan last week, uh, and uh, I couldn't tell it up there for sure. <laughs> Hard feather mission. <laughs> We're just so thrilled to be here, and we love this family, your pastor and his family, and we appreciate him so very, very much, and, and I know that uh, you do too. Thank you, brother. All righty. I don't think we'll need it unless you're going to tape. Uh, yeah, I'll, if you could wear it, brother, it would be I'll nice. be happy to, but I sure will. You need to give me just a minute to uh, get it all fixed up here. Sorry, we forgot. Uh, thank you, brother. Uh, for that. In fact, if you'll give me a list of your sins, I promise I won't preach on them this week. <laughs> Maybe I'll have your mama do it. You don't have much to say, brother. He acted like he didn't agree with that. <laughs> Amen. I was, just, I was thinking about that fellow. Uh, I heard about he got old. And uh, he didn't have any family left. Everybody was gone. So he decided that he'd sell everything he had and uh, move into an old folks home. So he found him a real nice high rise old folks home with a good fast elevator in it, you know. And he, he was happy to, uh, to, to be there. And the first day he was there, he's down in the recreation room uh, trying to get acquainted with all the people who would probably be his neighbors for the rest of his life. And so uh, he would go over here to this one and get acquainted and go back over here to this one and back over and back and forth. And that went on for most of the morning. And he kept noticing a real old lady sitting over here in a wheelchair all by herself and she kept staring at him. Every move he would make, her eyes would follow him. Well, he became uh, conscious of that after a while. And so every time he'd make a move, he'd go over here and he'd look up and she'd be looking at him. Go back over here and look up and she'd be looking at him. Well, after a while, he goes over to her and he says, Ma'am, it's very obvious that you've been staring at me all morning. He said, that sort of makes me curious to know why you're staring at me the way you are. She said, well, Sonny, you remind me so much of my third husband. 
Say, is your third husband good night, woman? How many husbands have you had? She said, two. <laughs> now, that's anticipation. And that's about the way I felt about this meeting. I had anticipated the, just being here and, and getting to know you. I have prayed for your church uh, ever since you, uh, it was started and, and uh, prayed for your pastor and still do. Pray for him uh, several times a week. And I appreciate the, what the Lord is doing here. And, I, and I'm serious when I say that I am really thrilled to be here with you uh, in this meeting and and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do uh, in and through this church Amen. in this wonderful ministry of missions and uh, I know your pastor has a heart for it and, Amen. and God will surely bless the, bless the church that involves themselves in it. Now let me say just in case that you won't be here tomorrow that Please come by the display tables and get uh, the uh, uh, propaganda, I guess you call it, <laughs> the literature. It's all free. Uh, and please uh, take uh, the GI banner that tells about our ministry, uh, military missions. And, and uh, we have a prayer card that, that uh, I hope you'll get and, and, and use it. It's a prayer card. That's what it's for, is to remind you to pray for us. Now, uh, when I take a prayer card from a missionary, that's a covenant that I make with that missionary to pray for them. I take them all the time, uh, and, and I pray for them. I put them on my, my prayer list. I have hundreds of them, uh, that, and I pray for them on a regular basis, uh, once a week at least. And uh, I encourage you to do that and, and, and get you a minute, make you a, a missionary prayer list and, and pray for the missionaries whose prayer cards that you've taken. Just put their name on. And then here's a brochure about the, the Ministry of Military Missions. Uh, and uh, I, I hope you'll come by and get to some of it and uh, all the BIMI World magazines that's free and uh, and the stuff there, and, and uh, I hope that you'll, you'll do that. Now, I, I am just thrilled tonight to uh, have a dear friend of mine, uh, <clears throat> Brother Mike Hogue and his uh, wife Dot with us. Uh, they live in Greenville. We were in the, the, the uh, Air Force together uh, 50 years ago out in Abilene at Dice Air Force Base. And, uh, and I've been telling people, I've not seen him in 50 years since that time, but uh, he rebuked me for that a while ago uh, at the supper table. And he said, uh, brother, he said, I, I've had a contact with you somewhere because I got your, your number in, in my telephone and couldn't find out. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago, I guess, I can't remember exactly when it was, I was coming through Greenville on my way to Waco to, to preach a meeting. And, uh, and I called him and, and found him at home and I went by to see him for just a brief uh, few minutes, but I, I have seen him since then. But one time in 50 years, and I'm just so glad that they, they came up from Greenville to be uh, here tonight and, and to uh, let me see them again and that was such a blessing we we worked together in the uh, uh, outside storage over at Dice Air Force Base and in fact I was in his home uh, on uh, uh, July was it the 19th or the 20th 1969 when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon Anybody remember that? If you remember that, let me see your hand. All right, so some of you are as old as I am anyway. Uh, but one of those days, I can't remember if it's the 19th or the 20th. Uh, and whatever date it was, I was in their home watching that. They had a TV, and uh, I was there watching it, and, and I remember that so well. But we're just so happy to uh, have them with us. And just raise your hand, Mike Dot. Just uh, they uh, they're uh, on the back seat, and so that's where 
a lot of people like to sit. <laughs> in fact, you have, you have to get to church early in a Baptist church to get a, a back seat. And, uh, thank you for coming, and I appreciate it so very, very much. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 8. And uh, then I want you to uh, just hold your place there and turn back to the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. And I'm going to read the first verse there in just a moment, verse number 1, and then we're going to go over to, to 2 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 9. That is the classic passage in the Bible on faith promise given and uh, we uh, I want to speak to you about that uh, these sessions that we have pastor asked me to do that and uh, and I'm thrilled to do it and uh, I guess he's heard me speak somewhere about it and so he asked me if I would uh, do that here and uh, we're happy to do that now uh, you know and I know that our Lord Jesus stood one day on the resurrection side of the grave just before he ascended back to heaven. And he said that to his disciples, by the way, which made up his first church, he placed first in his church of apostles, yes, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says. And so he's given the great commission to the church, not just to the apostles, to, to the church. Otherwise, it, uh, the commission would have died when the, when the apostles died, but he gave it to the church. And, and so, as a result of it, he, he said, uh, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I have no idea how many, uh, how anybody could have known this back in those days. But uh, it was estimated back uh, when Jesus gave that commission that there were approximately 246 million people on planet Earth at that time. Now, uh, somebody asked me here a while back, said, Preacher, do you really think that Jesus knew how many people would be on Earth in the, 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 uh, the year 2019? I said, since he's omniscient, I sort of believe that he knew how many people would be on earth this year. Uh, but while I speak to you tonight, the world population is in the neighborhood of 7.65 billion people. Now, my little finite mind can hardly comprehend that. Uh, 7.65 billion people, 7 billion, 650 million people on planet Earth. Uh, now, it, it, just to put it in, a little bit in, into perspective, uh, if, if we could stand, if it were possible, to stand that many people shoulder to shoulder at the equator that encircles the Earth, I want one of you uh, smart uh, May Mansfield boys to tell me how far around the earth it is at the equator. How about one of you smart adults telling me that? 25,000 Thank you. 25,000 miles. It's the conscience of the earth. Now, if we could stand that many people at the equator, 25,000 miles, they would encircle the earth approximately 50 times. My, I just can't begin to imagine that. If it were possible again to stand them shoulder to shoulder uh, in a row, and you got an automobile, and, and if it were possible to drive at 70 miles per hour, past 7.65 billion people, it would uh, take you 22 months of non-stop driving to drive by that many people. Just a little idea of that many people. 
Uh, they tell me that China's population, I think it's 1.4 billion people, but uh, it's probably even more than that. Uh, let's just say one and a half billion people. I think the Farmer's Almanac said uh, here a while back that it was probably, probably nobody even knew how many people were in red China. It, it could be as many as two billion people. But uh, let's just say a billion and a half. Uh, and, and, and let's say that a, a a move of God went through that country, sweeping thousands into the family of God. And if 30,000 people got saved every day, it would take 142 years to reach that many people for Christ. Now, that would that give you just a little idea what we're talking about. And Jesus commanded the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You say, preacher, that, that's an impossible task. Do you think the Lord would have commissioned his church to do something that would be impossible? I don't believe so. I believe it's very possible. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to get serious about missions and about getting the gospel out to the regions beyond. It's estimated out of 7.65 billion people that more than four and a half billion have never one time heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Christ. And so what I'm saying tonight is that the church has got an awesome task, an awesome responsibility to fulfill. Now, here's the question. And, you know, it does look impossible at times how, how the church is going to preach the gospel to that many people. But you know what? Uh, if the church would do what the Lord said about giving to missions, I am convinced that there never would be a lack of mission money anywhere at any time. And every time that a missionary stepped forth and said, God has called me, and they passed the test and, and, and that God's called them, then I believe there would be ample mission money to send that missionary off to the regions beyond. Amen. And I believe with all of my heart that we can reach this world in our generation if we'll get down to business and do it and do what God said. I want the, the two best looking Mansfield boys to come and help me if you would. The two best looking ones. <laughs> Uh, would you come? All right, here's one. I, I like that confidence. Yeah. And here's the other. I want you to give everybody one of these. And if you run out, I've got about 400 more in my uh, uh, case there. And so just give everybody, even if you're visiting, take one. Give one to Mike and Doc back there on the back row uh, and make sure they get one. You don't have to turn it in by just taking it out. But I want everybody to have one so you'll know what we're talking about this week with Faith Promise Missions. And what I want you to do is to put that card in your Bible. And uh, if you want to make sermon notes on the back of it, you can. But I want you to put it in your Bible. And tonight when you go home, I want you to lay that thing out before the Lord. And get in your prayer closet and just lay it out before the Lord. And say, the Lord, I'm just as serious as I can be about this. I want to have a part in missions. And uh, I want you to lay on my heart what you would want me to give to missions this next year. And if you'll be serious with God about that, God will speak to your heart. And you'll know, are you out? All right, uh, Benjamin, do you have any more? If not, I have more. Give Elijah some. Hello. <laughs> Tap him on the shoulder. Hey. 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 All right. 
There you go. <laughs> Good preacher's kids. Well, they're good looking. Yeah, they're good looking. They're good looking. Anyway. Amen. Thank you so much. Did everybody get one now? Anybody didn't get one? Raise your hand. All right. Thank you, fellas. Now, give me that list of sins, and I promise I won't preach on them. Okay. All right. Okay. He's going to write them down. <laughs> anyway, I want you to pray about that. Would you do that tonight? And in the morning, we're going to say more about it. And uh, don't put anything on the card right now because a certain way we ask you to fill them out that will help us to calculate them more easily. And, and get involved in this thing of missions giving. Uh, I, I had started a church in February of 1976 in Newport News, Virginia, over on the coast. And uh, we uh, moved into our first building in uh, in. January of uh, 1978, two years later, and we had our first Faith Promise Conference in February. I started giving to Faith Promise Missions. I filled out uh, my card, just like uh, you were going to be doing tomorrow. Started giving to Faith Promise in February of 1978. Now, and I say this to the glory of God. I got sense enough to know the only thing I've got to be proud of is Jesus. And I Amen. understand that. But pastor, to my knowledge, I have never missed a week of giving my faith promise to the Lord in that time. Amen. And I say that to God's glory. And what I'm saying is God will allow you to give if you've got a heart to do it. And I hope you just let the Lord speak to your heart. And then uh, uh, you, if you do that, that, that that'll be exactly what God wants this church to do for missions this next year. We'll have more to say about it as, as uh, tonight and tomorrow goes on. Now, in the Word of God, and understand now, Jesus said, go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, that's going to involve at least three main things. Number one, it involves a commission. That's what he gave. A commission, a command, a challenge, whatever you want to call it. But he gave that to his church. And it's going to involve also uh, a cost. It's going to cost some money to do that. And number three, it's going to involve a commitment. We're going to have to get serious about what God wants us to do about missions. And if you'll get real serious about it, and, 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 and pray that prayer that uh, Brother Matthews uh, spoke about tonight. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. But I would give you a little caution about it. You may have to answer that prayer yourself. Yeah. Amen? Uh, but to get serious about what God wants us to do about getting the gospel to the world and, and and what I want to speak about tonight and, and tomorrow is this thing of the cost of missions and, and how God uses His people to get the gospel out. Now, God calls the missionary to go to the field. And here goes the missionary out to the field. He knows that God's going to take care of him because God said that He would. And so he goes out with his family out to the regions beyond where God's called him. And, and knowing God's going to take care of him, he's confident of that. Now, here's the question. How does God take care of his missionaries? Oh, you say, preacher, I got it all figured out. I've been thinking about this thing. On the first day of every month, God rains $100 bills out of the sky. All that missionary's got to do is go out and pick it up like the children of Israel gather manna and stick it in their pocket and they're good to go for the next month. <coughs> Don't work that way, does it, Brother Mansfield? Yes, do you ever gather them $100 bills in England? Just don't work it. Then how does God provide for his missionaries? Glad you asked because I want to tell you these next uh, couple of uh, services. 
God uses us, His people, now listen, to give through us into the local church. And the local church sends it out to the mission fields around the world where God lays on their heart to send it. You see, God will give through you what He'll not necessarily give to you because he knows you have a heart for God and that he can trust you to bring it to the house of God. And God will give through you. That local church is the depository and the paying agent for missions. And as you allow God to give through you, it's an amazing thing. This was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my Christian life as far as my walk with God and my and the, to build my faith is trusting God every week to bring this in uh, through it. And pastor, I've, I've given it every week to my knowledge, but every year I have upped my faith promise. And sometimes twice a year we would have a, a booster conference at mid-year. And God has always provided for me and through me so that I could bring it to the house of God. This past year, uh, I get to do this once a year myself in my church. And this past year, uh, I thought I'd had it figured out, you know, and my wife and I pray about it. And uh, really, uh, in the mission conference, we, we get down to business praying about it. And I thought we had it figured out. But then when it started to fill out the car, God just wouldn't let me put that on that car. And I said, Lord, what do you want? And uh, he said, I, I want you to do more than that. And he laid a figure on my heart. It, it scared me because I was going to have to get on the water out there, uh, walk, walk with him on the water because, it, you know, it just wasn't logically possible to do it. But he said, that's what I want. So before, before that, that we filled it out, uh, and we and the church was filling them out. I went to Joyce and I said, "Honey, this is what God laid on my heart." She said, "That's what God laid on your heart. Let's do it." And we put her down and hadn't missed hadn't missed a, a lick yet on it. Amen. God always provides, and that's what faith promise is. Now, I want to share with you tonight and tomorrow the biblical concept of faith promise giving. And I want to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse, in fact, I want to read verses 1 and 2, but we'll look at verse 1. Paul said, now concerning the collection for the saints. Now, I want you to underscore that little word for there. This is, understand, a collection for the saints. He didn't say it's a collection for from the saints, because that'd be the tithe. But here is a collection for saints that are ministering out in other areas beyond the parameter of the local church. He's talking about the missions offering here. And he said, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order, and that word order is not talking about a set of instructions, you do this. It's a system, a systematic way of giving in this mission's offering. He said, now if I've, I've given order. Uh, in other words, as he went across Galatia and the, the regions of Asia Minor, planting those churches and establishing those churches, and there were many of them, Paul set up an organized system of giving over and above the tithe for the purpose of sending out missionaries. It's for the saints. Now watch what he said. As I've given order, I've set up this means of, of giving the missions to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. He said, Corinth, what you need to do over there is to have a missions conference. Now you've got to read between the lines to get some of that. But he said you need to set up this kind of giving in your church. And you know what? The Corinthians did it. And they began to give to missions. 
You know, God is a giving God, isn't He? Amen. In fact, everything in God's economy is set up on the principle of giving. The sun gives. The moon gives. The stars give. The animals give. The plants give. The earth gives. Everything about God's economy gives. Do you know the, 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 the species of, of God's creation that He has the most trouble with getting to give? <laughs> you guessed it. Uh, it's the human species. And it ought not to be that way because God wants His people to be a given people. And I believe with all my heart those who are dedicated completely to God will have a willing desire to gladly give to the work of God. Now, when uh, we talk about giving, I want you to understand that we're on biblical grounds. A lot of people have a negative attitude when a preacher preaches on giving. And they think a preacher ought not to preach on giving. I don't know where they got that, but they didn't get it out of the Bible. That's right. Because the Bible is literally filled with admonitions of the people of God to give. Amen. In fact, if you'll go from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find 1,565 references to the people of God given to God in the Bible. Now, that's biblical to give. By the way, faith is mentioned in the Bible a little over 500 times. Prayer is mentioned in the Bible just a little under 500 times. Heaven is mentioned in the Bible for more than 500, 552 times to be exact. But giving is mentioned 1,565 times. Three times more than faith and prayer and, 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 uh, and uh, heaven. Now you think about that just a minute. Uh, have you ever heard anybody leave a church where a pastor preached on I, I don't like to go to that church. All it does that preacher preaches on giving. Every time I go, he preaches on giving. Well, do you ever hear somebody leave a service and say, you know, every time I go to that church, that preacher's preaching on faith. I never have heard that. That preacher preaches on prayer. All the proper possibilities of prayer and what prayer is. You don't have any prayer. That preacher, every time I go to that church, he preaches about heaven. About going to heaven. Get so tired of hearing about him talking about heaven. No, you don't hear that. But it's always giving. And I don't understand that. He's on Bible grounds. Three times more right. than faith and prayer and heaven and whatever. So what I'm saying is, it's in the Bible. And you know God never put anything in this Bible just for the purpose of taking up space. If he said it one time, that ought to be enough. Yes. Yeah. But over and over and over again and again and again, God talks about this thing of giving we should never have a negative attitude about that. But we ought to say, oh, I want to do more than what I do. Now, having understood that, here in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, I didn't read the second verse. You can read that sometime. He gives five things about missing given there. That, that I, I'm not, that, that's not my purpose tonight. Uh, but uh, you, you'll notice how that Paul establishes the policy of mission giving. Now, I want you to turn over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you would. And here in this text, we note how he explains the principle of it. He began by establishing the policy in 1 Corinthians 16. And now he comes over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And he begins to explain the principle of it. Now, uh, let, again, let me put it in context and tie the two scriptures together. Paul had told the Corinthians, hey, you need to set up a system of giving in your church. 
like the, the churches of Galatia did. And you know what? They did it. And Paul was elated over it. He was thrilled about it. Every place he went, far and near, he told them about what the church at Corinth had done. How excited they were about uh, giving. In fact, if you'll look over in chapter 9 and, and, and uh, verse number uh, uh, 2, the last part of that verse, he said, he said, your zeal hath provoked very many. Paul is saying, hey, you ought to have been over there in that church at Corinth when we had that missions conference. They got so excited about filling out that faith promise card. You've got to read between the lines. He was over there. But uh, he said they got excited about missions giving. And, and boy, those people in Macedonia, when he went over and told them about that, they said, well, glory to God, Paul, if that crowd over there in, in court can do it, let us have a part in that. And so Paul did explain, he explained it to them, and they responded to it. Now, we pick up our reading in chapter 8 and verse 1, and understanding what we just said, the, the, the context of tying them the two together, he said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. I want you to witness something, Paul said. I want you to see something here. How that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, at yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did. Not as we hoped. That word hope means expected. Paul said, I was just expecting them to give a, 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 uh, an offering. He said, but now watch what they did. He said, they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Now, here's what Paul is saying. A year has gone by since the Corinthians made their commitment to give the missions. A year has gone by and they've not done one little thing about giving, making that commitment fulfilled. And so a year later now in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth. And he's reminding them that they made a sacred commitment to God. And that they need to do what they said they were going to do. And, and, and he told them, he said, now look, in verse 1, I want you to witness something here. I want you to witness the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And what he's saying here, here is a practical living demonstration of how it can be done. And if you'll follow their example, Corinth, you can do it too. So tonight, I want to preach about the practical demonstration of missions given. And if you'll notice, and I'm just going to have time to, 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 to mention these and go on and, and close her down tonight. But there are four things that he mentions in the verses to follow that I read in your hearing just a little while ago about how the churches of Macedonia made the very same commitment that the, churches at, uh, that the church at Corinth had made. The only difference was uh, that they gave theirs. And the church at Corinth has done nothing about fulfilling their commitment. And so he's writing to them and saying, hey, here's the way they did it. Here's the practical demonstration of the way they did it and the way that you can do it and get it done. And so he mentions four things in the verses that follow. First of all, you'll notice he mentions the priority of their giving in verse number two. He said uh, that, that uh, how they did a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. You'll notice that, that, that uh, first of all, they refused to allow anything to deter them. It was their priority to do it. They wouldn't let anything. They gave in spite of, number one, their problems. 
They were going through great afflictions. They didn't just have one little affliction here, but there was a great trial of affliction, Paul said. Sometimes when you read the books of First and Second Thessalonians and the, the book of Philippians, those were uh, two Macedonian churches. Uh, Berean was another one. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berean. Uh, those are the Macedonian churches he's talking about. Sometimes when you read those books, underscore the number of times the word suffering is mentioned there. Over and over. And these people were suffering for their faith. They were going through a great trial of afflictions, but they refused to allow that to deter them from doing what they told God they were going to do about their missions giving. Now, let me ask you a, a quick question. Is that the attitude of most believers today? <laughs> you know very well it's not. First thing they do when there's not enough money for the month, uh, they quit their giving to God. And that's the worst thing it can do. Yeah. Uh, because God said He would allow you to do that if you would just trust Him to do it. Now, not only did they give in spite of their problems, notice they gave in spite of their poverty. These people, Paul said in the latter part of verse 2, they were in deep poverty. Not just poor people, but extremely poor people. They knew what it was like to be poor. That word, Warren Wearsby said that, that word poverty describes a beggar with absolutely nothing and with no hope of ever getting anything. But they still gave in spite of that poverty. They were poor. Now, I know what it's like to be poor. And, and some of you may have experienced that in the past. May be doing it right now. But when I was a little boy, I grew up on a, a, the first eight years of my life on a farm in Upper Spartanburg County, South Carolina, way out from nowhere. And uh, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody around us was poor. Amen? And, and we just didn't think about being poor. We grew our own vegetables. We, we worked hard to do that, canned them, and, 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 and I mean, we did all of that. We, uh, we milked our own cow. Uh, I was telling Andrea uh, before service, I was milking a cow before I started school. I, I knew how to milk a cow before I learned the ABCs. I mean, I got good at it too. I, I, could, I could knock a fly off the barn wall with that baby. And, and uh, I was good at it. And, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, we had that cow we milked. Uh, that was some good stuff. I loved that fresh cow milk back in those days. Anybody ever, ever, anybody ever churned butter? You turn, you know what it's like to churn? My, my little arm would feel like it's going to break off. That we churn that butter. Boy, that, that butter milk sure was good, wasn't it? And, uh, and it'd make a puppy pull a freight train. <laughs> Love that butter, homemade butter. We had we, we killed a hog every week. In fact, we killed two hogs every year. And, and uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, I remember Paul would shoot that hog in the head and. And uh, when I'd get up and get out there, Granny had that uh, a, a huge pot and had a fire underneath it and, and scald in hot water. And, and they had that hog strung up by, um, on a chain uh, of, of hall or something out there by his hind leg. Anybody ever kill a hog? You know what it's like to kill a hog? And, and uh, man, they, they scald that baby down, scrape it real good, you know, and, and uh, then uh, cut it open and and uh, you know, get the good stuff out, uh, the lard. Uh, my, my granny never cooked anything without frying it. And she'd reach down in that lard bucket and get a handful of lard, throw it in that big old black uh, fly, frying pan. Uh, and, and she fried everything. Uh, she'd never heard of cholesterol. <laughs> if she had us, she would have tried to batter it and fry it. <laughs> never heard of it. Uh, but uh, and, and then we'd get to chitlins. Good stuff. Anybody ever eat any chitlins? 
if you can get by the smell of them, they're not so bad. Uh, but uh, you, you can't stand to smell them too much. Uh, but we, we, that's the way that I grew up those first eight years of my life. We were poor. And, and I believe that these people were somewhat like that. But they did not allow any of that to deter. Let me give you this. Not only the priority, but the power they're given. Verse number three. He says, for to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Now, did you notice that they gave to their power? And then they, that, that's what they could do, by the way. That's their ability they had to do it. And then they gave beyond their power. That's what they, they could not give. Now, it's one thing to give what you got and another thing to give what you don't got. If you go to give him what you do not have, you had better get some faith involved in it or you're not going to be able to last too long. And this is the thing that we're talking about right here. They gave everything they had but after they had given everything they had, they still had a holy dissatisfaction. They had not done enough. And they asked God to help them do more. And God granted the request. And God allowed them to give what they did not have. In other words, God gave through them. That's what faith promise is in a nutshell. God giving through you. And God will allow you to do it. Uh, now, I, I, I guess it... Uh, in my limited ability, I'd, I'd have the the uh, the power to reach down here and pick up this microphone. What does that weigh? Three, four pounds, maybe five pounds or so. I could hoist that thing up over my head and take it out and through them doors and set it in the parking lot. Nobody would applaud me for doing that. You know why? Because a 200 plenty pound preacher ought to be able to pick up five pounds and hoist it over his head. Now let me tell you something, buddy. If I reached over here and grabbed a hold of this piano and hoisted that thing up over my head with one hand and took it down the aisle and set it out in the parking lot, that would raise some eyebrows. <laughs> you know why? I may have the power to, to pick up that microphone and stand. But I don't have the ability to pick that up. And if you saw me pick up that piano and put it up over my head and haul it outside, you would assume that I had some unseen help somewhere. Now, that's what we're talking about yeah. with this same thing, promise. That's the power of it. God gives us the ability to do it. Let me give you a third thing quickly. I, just, yeah, I can just mention it. Number four, or, or number three, verse four. Notice the partnership of their giving. You see what Paul said? He said, pray in us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the minister and to the saints. Did you notice that the, the, church, the, the churches in Paul's day were actually begging the missionary to take, on, to take their support? Begging them to take the money. Please, missionary, take our money. We want you to get to the mission field. <laughs> Brother Chris, things have changed in a few <laughs> centuries, and not it? It's not the churches begging the missionary to take the money. It's the missionaries crisscrossing the country begging the churches to support them so they can get to the mission field. But he calls it here a fellowship. Take upon us the fellowship of the minister. That's what happens when you take on the support of a missionary, you're taking on that missionary's fellowship with you. And you become a partner with him. I close with this. And that's the promptings of their giving. Verse number five. Paul said, and this they did. Not as we hoped or expected, but they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. What was it that prompted these believers in spite of their adverse circumstances? Great poverty. What was it that prompted them to do what they said that they were going to do? Well, whatever it was, I would to God that every one of us in this building would get it. I'll tell you what it was. They first gave their own selves right. to the Lord. 
And once they had given their own selves to the Lord, they had no problem giving the mission off. Did you see the last part of that verse? Paul said, and then they gave unto us by the will of God. When we give ourselves to the Lord, then it's easy to give uh, the mission off. They can send out the missionaries around the world. I don't know of a better way to end the first night of this meeting than this to give ourselves to the Lord to fresh and new. I have no idea where you stand with God. That's between you and the Lord. But if you have never given yourself to the Lord in total dedication, say, Lord, I'm taking my hands off my life tonight. I want you to have my whole being. I give you myself, Lord. You do with me what you want to do with me. I'm not asking you to surrender to be a missionary or surrender to preach or anything like that or surrender to what we often call full-time Christian service. I'm just asking you to surrender to the Lord. Just give your life to Him. That's where it begins. When we give ourselves to the Lord, then God can do business with us. That's what those Macedonians did. And that's why they could give even beyond their ability to give. I hope tonight that every one of us in this building will have a heart to do that. You might want to come to this altar and that would be fine. Or you may just want to bow right there in your pew and uh, just uh, say, Lord, from my heart, I give you myself. I want you to be Lord of my life. And Lord, I'll be anything you want me to be. And Lord, giving you myself means that I'll do anything you want me to do. And Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll say anything you want me to say. And I'll give anything you want me to give. And if we'll just so surrender our lives, that's all that's necessary. That'll take care of that faith promise anymore. What God would have you give. That'll take care of whether God will use you or not if you'll just surrender yourself to Him. God will not call most people to the mission field. We understand that He don't do that. But you see, God expects every one of us to be involved in getting out the gospel message. Whether it's across the street from where we live, across the state from where we live, or across the sea from where we live, God wants us to be actively involved in it. You find out what you're supposed to do. And then with all of your heart, soul, body, and mind, do it for His glory. And He'll bless you for it. Let's stay.